I have enough room. Okay. I, we'll try to. Exciting. Yeah. Yay. Okay, so it's recorded right now. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Mei Wong. I am the remote clinic coordinator for Albany. I want to thank you all and uh, for a attending this uh, beautiful program, remote clinic slash caravan info session. For this program, we hope that you will participate and help us out volunteer through the remote clinic. Um, and I guess slide, slide tab. Slide time. Um, um, well, uh, and this event is being recorded uh, for a possible future training use. So be, be careful what you say. Okay, uh, I'll start this slide. So I just want to let everyone know um, the pro bono clinic started off in 2015 for walk in clinics. Uh, what people do is they come in and uh, they may or may not have uh, an appointment. And there will be volunteer attorneys, law students, interpreters helping out um, to find out what the issues are and, and to kind of look through paperwork for the, uh, the individuals who come in. There's usually a, uh, a visual presentation that will teach them about um, some procedural laws, uh, updates with the laws. And since last March, all in all walk-in clinics had to be canceled due to the pandemic. And now what we what we did last June was to start what we called a remote clinic. And people would come and actually no, they aren't coming. They will call in, leave a message, and we will get back to them. Uh, do you see the share screen? Hi, everyone. I just want to double check to make sure that you are able to hear me. Uh, I can hear you. OK, thanks. Um, is the share screen working for everyone? Yes. Uh, yes, I see the share screen. Oh, thank you. I guess we're going to just move next to the next screen. Um, okay. So as I was saying, since last June 2020, we had over Actually, yes, we had over 300 calls. Um, most of the common legal issues are related to landlord tenant, immigration, family matrimonial, employment, and elder law. We have two different numbers for uh, people who can call through. Uh, we have the English and Chinese line, the Japanese and also Korean line. Based from our statistics, 
we are able to contact 75% of the people who have left us have left us a voicemail message. And approximately a majority of the callers, they are calling for legal matter relating to this to themselves. And a majority also speak a different language and they have limited English proficiency. As I was saying, like we have uh, several major legal issues, but the top three would be housing, immigration, and family law. Uh, these are very important numbers. You don't need to memorize them. We will provide you with them when you uh, speak with someone, if you choose to volunteer with us, and we highly, highly recommend that you do so, you will be able to get this information. We do also have a legal referral and information service line. And what they have is that they have a panel of attorneys that we can give, uh, re that we can refer the callers to if there are certain issues that we cannot provide them with information and it's necessary for them to actually hire a private attorney to uh, address their legal matter. So how does the legal remote, sorry, how does the remote legal clinic work? So like I said before, the caller will leave a message. Uh, they tend, we, we don't have a lot of volunteers. So the waiting time can be five to 10 days after we make the assignment. The coordinator team will listen to the voicemail message and then assign the, our volunteers uh, these weekly calls. There are several important things to take note of. As a volunteer attorney, you are not taking on any cases. Um, we are only providing legal information. We do not provide legal representation. Uh, we do not uh, help people file paperwork or create paperwork. Um, if the person requires legal representation, like I said before, our legal referral and information services will be able to reach back to them. And if like, the volunteer attorney wishes to refer the caller to his or her own firm. We we want you guys to let us know first. Um, it can either be for a pro bono or a paid representation. It is uh, necessary, it's very important that when before you make the calls, please hide your number by dialing star six seven. You do not need to provide your personal contact information to the caller um, other than your name and your, your expertise in the field. Uh, we do not want people to solicit business from the callers unless you join Albany's uh, legal referral information service line. If you have difficulties with the call, you can always let the caller know that we can contact them back and we'll find additional information and in our referrals for him or her. For our volunteer requirements, we do require that attorneys be licensed to practice and admitted to New York State. You have to be practicing law for at least one year. You are not required to be an expert in any field. Uh, it knowledgeable in, in a certain language would be extremely helpful, it's not required. We do have a lot of um, knowledgeable translators, interpreters to help us. Uh, we do want that, we do wish that you can take at least, actually you must, you must take at least one case assignment each month. For interpreters, um, you can be fluent in English and at least one of the languages that, uh, that we serve to the public. Um, basic knowledge of legal terms and concepts for interpretation, which we will actually look into a little bit. Um, there will be basic interpretation training provided. Um, I guess uh, 
we don't require expertise in a specific field, but we do prefer if you have experience in doing like basic intake, like how to ask questions uh, to get the, the get to the legal issue or issue spotting with the callers. And here comes the great part for law students uh, or anyone who is a graduate who needs to com uh, complete the New York State Bar's 50 hours pro bono services. Uh, your legal assistance um, towards this clinic does count towards the, um, the pro bono requirement for admission. Uh, we tend to pair up law students, graduates and out of state attorneys with licensed uh, and admitted New York State attorneys. Um, so that they can shadow them when they take on these calls. There can also be assignments for legal research and legal writings. If you need any additional information, please contact our public, uh, our pro bono committee services co-chair, Judy Lee, and it can be at pro bono at albany.org or judy.lee at albany.org. We also have a wonderful pro bono resource page on Albany's website. A lot of law students have helped us uh, create this website, update the law, although right now we are working on updating it. And there are training videos, past training videos that I encourage all to take a look at. And it will provide you with more information as to how you can get involved with us. More information about a remote clinic. Yeah, this is the, a screenshot of the website um, and it provides all the information and you can see all the training videos and resources linked on this web page. Uh, if you ever have uh, any questions about how to, what you might, what information you might need when you volunteer at the remote clinic. And I am going to double check for something. Who's disabled by this point? Oh, threat. Hmm. All right, Judy, I'm going to disable you for one moment and then I'm going to share. Do you have the, the what is it, the, the document or? You can, you can share screen. Okay. I do that. Just want to double check to make sure that you guys are able to see the screen. What I like to do is I like to tell people the top 10 things to consider at the pro bono clinics. Um, if you are able to see the screen, I guess, let me know. Uh, we can see it. I can oh. see it. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> so one thing is uh, confidentiality. All the calls that you that you receive and that you are participating in you have to keep things confidential. Um, if possible, make sure like, uh, you know, the other side can provide us with documents to read. Again, we are not helping people fill out forms, but it is extremely helpful knowing what documents they have received to understand what we can help them with. I think this is a great rule for everyone, um, law students, attorneys. You should consider um, applying the IRAC formula that we've learned through law school um, you know, issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. And if there's really no way to make a conclusion out of the call, then um, consider providing referral slash reality, um, which means sometimes you have to let uh, the caller understand with their legal matter. It's better to apply common sense than um, taking action that might not lead them to anywhere. I think one example that I can provide to you will be parking tickets. We do get calls about uh, parking tickets, parking fines, and they would want to contest them. I'm not saying that they cannot contest them, but we are not in a position to actually advise them how to contest. And given the ticket price itself, like if they lose through the hearing itself, is it worthwhile to appeal I think you have to consider the cost of doing so, which is why I put in reality. Sometimes you really have to look into common sense and what the reality is. 
a, mo a majority of the calls take around 15 to 30 minutes. We want um, volunteers to understand like once a client uh, starts dragging or starts the story with once upon a time, you should really control the conversation and find out like, can we really get to the point of the issue? We don't want parties to stay on a call for more than 30 minutes. And we also don't want the client to lead you on. And at that point, you kind of realize it, we are not getting into the issue itself. Um, part of the clinic is like, we want everyone to treat everyone respectfully. There are times when people call in and they may have um, mental health issues. And I think with with our line of work, we want to be empathetic. It is great to understand if when you, when you hear the caller, you strongly believe that they, they may not have a case, but you want to respect them. You want to uh, let them understand that perhaps they should seek uh, professional medical help and that can help create the paperwork they may need. Um, but at the same time, they might actually get that mental health um, consultation and assistance. Uh, this is just like a um, little bit of phrase that you can consider using. And at times when you do deal with uh, people who are angry, I would just politely, you know, signal the coordinators or the person that you are shadowing, you know, let them know, like, maybe we can talk to them. Uh, I'm sorry, this slide is actually used for our walk-in clinics. Um, but I do know that like sometimes when the clients are angry on the phone calls, um, rather than just ending the call itself or hanging up on them, I would let them vent because giving them a, an ear to vent on actually kind of helps with the situation because you're trying to let them get their word out. You're trying to let them speak. How to deal with clients who think they know everything. I think the best phrase to use is just like, they have all the answers. You really can't offer any more information, not advice, sorry. And that it's like, you know, you wish them best of luck. The whole idea of the remote call is not being an encyclopedia. We have Google for that. Um, yes, Google is actually my best friend. You can try the IRAC method that I stated before and always try to research a little bit about the case and find out what the statute of limitations is. Um, don't worry about the law students part. You don't need to actually give us a chart of it. It's easy to look it up online. Um, those who have not taken the bar yet, this is the bar exam. There's no pass or fail. You don't need to impress anyone and there will be no grades. Uh, like I said before, the idea of the remote clinic is to actually help people who have difficulty getting somewhere to get legal services or legal information or even like information about the court system. This is kind of like the emergency room, but you don't need to overthink. 90% of the time, like the clients have consulted with others and they do actually want a second or third opinion. But like I said before, we're not giving advice, we're giving information and referrals. I think the referrals is the best way to allow them to gain access to uh, the resources and the assistance that they need. Listening carefully is extremely important. Like I said before, um, a lot of times people may just want to vent and you will discover that the issue that they're asking for may not be related to the topic that we've heard from their message. Sometimes it can be topics leading from immigration to family law to housing law. And this is a way, and this is an opportunity for many people, many folks to actually address like what the issues are and to spot the issue. Oh yeah, speak up introverts. Uh, this is actually a great program to train law students and certain attorneys who don't litigate in court. There are no dumb questions and it would be great if you just speak up. Like I uh, and also empathize, don't judge. Um, we have had cases in which I've heard like someone has been paying another person $80,000 in cash, business partner ran away. And you'll be wondering like, well, where did they get the cash? Uh, 
that's not for us to to really consider. I think what we are trying to consider is like, well, what are the resources out there available? Are like, is the are there actually in this case, it's best to actually refer to the legal referral information service. And just just actually not advice, but just to provide the information accordingly. Um, our next segue to our presentation will be for uh, Kwok Ng and Jesse Liu. And what they will do is that they will help provide us guidelines for pro bono clinic volunteers, how to interpret um, and how to provide, uh, you know, best translated parts for, for our callers. Um, do you need, do you want me to stop the screen or? Oh, no, keep, <clears throat> thank you, me. Oh, you can keep the screen okay. on. Thanks. We'll, we'll just go to the slide. Hi, good evening. My name is Kwok. Um, I'm one of the vice chairs of the Pro Bono and Community Service Committee, alongside with Jesse Liu and Karen King. Uh, we'll be talking about interpreting and working with interpreters. Um, personally, I used to serve as an interpreter in the Pro Bono Clinic before I graduated from law school. And since licensed as an attorney, I also had the opportunity to work with um, other interpreters. And I'm currently a member of the Advisory Committee on Language Access in the court system. Um, my co-vice chair, Judge Liu, um, who is here now, I don't know if you can see her, um, she similarly has a very strong background with experience training and working with interpreters, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So let's go to the definition of interpretation. Sometimes you may hear the word interpreting and translating. Um, they are often used interchangeably, and by definition, interpreting refers to the um, the act of translating the language verbally, and translating is a term used for written interpretation. So, most of the interpretation done in here in this clinic is for oral. So we use the term really we use the term interpretation here, and that's what we will mostly use throughout this um, this exercise. And so once you um, go to a consultation, right? What should you do first? Well, you first need to introduce yourself, your role, and um, what you're here for. Very often when you see a client, um, a, client's, a client will come in like stressed, and in a case when you're on the phone, so we just wanna to talk to you. Uh, but that's not the case, right? You're here to interpret, and you have to tell the client that that's what you're here to do. So remind the client what your role is so that later your client won't just keep asking you questions and won't let you go. Um, and also you should remind the client to pause from time to time during the consultation so that they will have time to interpret. Um, very Again, very often they would treat the interpreter as like the go-to person. They would, Sometimes they will ignore the attorney altogether. So um, do remind them to pause so that you can be given the chance to translate. For attorneys, um, if you have a question, so actually, actually let's go over the, that list. Try to convey one principal idea at a time, refrain from using long run on sentences. Now, this is an easy point, right? Uh, the mind of an interpreter works differently than, than the speaker. Uh, if you haven't had experience working with an interpreter, or if you haven't had ex the chance to, to interpret, here's how it works. In English, it will be A, B, C, D, E, right? And then the interpreter has to process those the words and then translate it into, um, or interpret it into their own target language. So we're talking about grammatically and in sequence, all the words, all the concept in one sentence has to be rearranged so that it takes time. It's kind of like a puzzle. Um, only that you cannot stop. You gotta keep doing the puzzle. So it will help a lot if you don't, for the attorneys, the speaker, not to use long run on sentences because it will just throw the interpreter off. And piggybacking on off on that, of course, give them time to interpret between sentences. Um, otherwise, the interpreter may may lose the train of thought and and simply. Get lost and once an interpreter is lost then it's really easy to go downhill from there so pause and give time for the interpreter 
to do its job. Interact directly with clients. Address to the clients, not the interpreter. Right. Um, this is extremely important here because, again, the, inter the interpreter's job is to translate, interpret. So you should always just, whatever, whatever word you use, stay with it. Okay. So talk to the client for the attorney. Talk to the client. And so don't address, don't, don't talk to the interpreter as if, what did he say? Don't talk to the interpreter that way. Just ask, facing the client, ask him or her, um, what do you mean? Don't ask the interpreter with what, what, this, what this client wants, okay? Because that will just confuse the interpreter. Avoid, avoid legal, okay, right. So that's an easy one. Um, and I, I always have a good example for this one. Order show cause, right? Um, it is difficult for an interpreter to to um, understand sometimes when you use very crazy um, legal words. Uh, sometimes it's necessary. For example, order to show cause. Now, if you hear the word order to show cause, an interpreter may not understand or may not be able to translate accurately what it means. So sometimes you have to, the attorney has to explain those um, terminology so that the interpreter may have a better understanding and so that he will have a chance to better translate or explain to the client. Check the interpreter. So if you speak two words and the interpreter says like 20 words, right? Or the other way around, something's wrong. Talk to the interpreter, ask the interpreter why the, um, the significant differences in length and uh, find out what happened. If time permits, meet with the interpreter before a session to go over legal matters. Right. This is also um, is a good idea because the interpreter will be well prepared to know what the issues are. Explain word the concept upon the interpreter's request. Right. And if the interpreter doesn't know what you mean, which can happen very often, <laughs> explain to her or him. Be aware of cultural differences. Ask the interpreter for clarification if needed. Right, it happens a lot. Um, I've worked, when I was an interpreter, I, wor I worked with attorneys and attorneys very often may not know what I was talking about. I know I was doing a good job translating, but he or she may not know, the attorney may not know. So um, if you don't know as an attorney, just ask. All right, so we can go to interpreters. Uh, Jesse, do you want to jump in? If not, I can continue. All right, I'll continue. Uh, sorry, I just I just realized I muted myself. Um, I think um, I've, I had like one or two points that I want to say. So for the interpreters, um, Cock mentioned that uh, like for the attorneys, uh, you need to speak directly with and to the client instead of letting the interpreter to speak directly to and with the client. Um, because for monolingual or like um, uh, clients that with uh, limited English ability, they uh, are easy to create an emotional connection with someone who can speak their own language than an attorney who can only speak English. So um, they will tell um, the interpreter like, um, things that is not related, related to the court, uh, to, to the case. And then they will start like basically telling their own like uh, stories, how they got fraud, how they got like treated badly by other people that are not relevant to the case. That is not something that we want to know during the consultation. Um, so uh, interpreters should like an uh, attorney should try not to let the client to create like an emotional connection with the interpreter instead of with the attorney. Um, that in that way, it is easier for the attorney to carry out the uh, consultation and conversation with the client instead of le let let the interpreter to carry away this conversation. Um, and also, um, I don't remember if Clark has mentioned that both of the parties should speak slow. So I've been working as an interpreter at the pro bono clinic and also I've been working as an attorney at a clinic. Um, I've been on both sides of the, of the parties and sometimes I've realized that attorneys speak very fast without knowing that they speak really fast. Um, in this way, um, 
clients or the interpreter easily they are easily got confused because they uh, some of information just flew by um, without being clarification and also um, observation and explanation are very important during uh, the, the the consultation in that involved with a uh, with an interpreter. And I know like in the event of a remote clinic, uh, that the, ob the observation part is quite hard, but for the attorneys, your job is to, um, your job is to get the point that the interpreter started to hesitate. Like uh, when they started to hesitate, that probably shows that the interpreter either doesn't understand what the legal term means, or they're trying, to, they have a hard time trying to find a correct translation or interpretation for the term. So if you, um, if you realize that, um, stop the conversation and ask the interpreter if they understand it, uh, if that is possible. Um, and also, um, sometimes an interpreter, even with like a proper amount of legal training um, or who passed the bar exam but is pending admission, they might have a, a different background than the attorney who is doing uh, the consultation or uh, than the, the client. So for some of the terms, the interpreter might not necessarily understand. And so for example, speak to client or speak to uh, the interpreter firing up the form numbers that without realizing the other party doesn't understand at all what I'm like saying, what I'm talking about. So uh, um, in this, in, like in, the, in these kind of situations, give time to the interpreters to um, do the Google search, to understand what you're talking about. And uh, of course, like for the attorneys, don't use like those terms that are like very confusing. So um, that's that's it for from me for now. Um, if you want to um, keep going, sure. I'll I'll just finish. I guess finish the list, um, and then just you uh, feel free to um, come back in after I finish the the list. Okay. So for interpreters, really, it's the same thing. Um, Never substitute the, the attorney's words with your own. Right, very important. Um, so I think Jesse has mentioned that um, interpreters are non-attorneys and they are, can, they are not to give a legal advice. And that's not like we don't like interpreters giving advice. It's legally, they cannot. So um, don't, when the attorney use a word, um, interpret that word and let a client know. Um, if, you don't, if you don't agree, you can talk to the attorneys on the side separately, but don't um, substitute anything. Do not engage in a side conversation with the client. Now, I, I guess so that's obvious, right? You, um, you don't want to have, you don't want to also, that's for a, few, for, for a few reasons. You don't want to let the client feel that you are his, um, his attorney. You don't want to let the client basically just latch onto you and keep talking to you. That's a good one. Good reason, and the other one is the attorney will feel left out. The attorney won't know what's going on, and it's vital for an attorney to know exactly what is what's being spoken um, to give a full, uh, meaningful legal advice. Do not guess. Ask attorneys for clarification. It goes both way. Do not guess what the attorney is speaking. And do not guess what the client is speaking. If you have any questions, ask for clarification. Be accurate. Omit or add nothing, and that really is goes is connects to the first point which is don't substitute the attorney's words um, do your best to interpret a word to word interpret everything even though it may seem irrelevant um, that is important again for two reasons one is that the way the attorney or the words that the attorneys use choose to use uh, there's a reason why they choose the, uh, those words so without second guessing what the attorney um, was trying to say just translate and then let the client hear it and the same thing goes from the words from the client to the attorney it's very important for the attorney to know exactly what is spoken so um, try not to miss words use first person mode um, i've addressed that before um simply that you <clears throat> simply that you can that people won't get confused 
as to your role and as to who they're speaking with. Ask clients to pause if necessary, right? That's, I think, corresponds to what Jesse was saying earlier. Um, speak slower and um, you can take notes if you need. Um, in my own experience, I don't take notes because I, my handwriting is bad. I write down something. I don't even know what I, what I just wrote. Avoid using necessary legal terminologies, right? We've spoken to that already. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the context, and you can tell me just reframe direct translation. Right, so that's where sometimes the subtle difference between translation and interpretation is. Uh, interpretate, for interpretation, even though you are not to um, change the word or substitute the attorney's word, but in those cases where it cannot be translated or that if translated directly, it wouldn't make sense, then use your judgment uh, to um, interpret what the attorney or what the client means. Jesse? Mm, I don't have anything to add. Thank you so much, Kwok, and thank you, Jesse. Um, I do want to actually reiterate one point, um, and this is regarding for the pro bono hours. I, I think we have a lot of law students out here today. And if you are trying to apply or for the pro bono hours, you need to keep a written work log uh, specifying the hours and the type of work that you are doing so that when it is being submitted to the pro bono um, committee service, they'll be able to check and then um, issue a certification for you. And now I want to introduce to you all uh, Ms. Jenny Park. She will be the coordinator for our caravan project. This is our first time actually collaborating with Columbia University. And um, I will let Jenny speak about this program. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, May. And just wanted to make sure that you can all hear me. Yes, okay. I can. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, as May said, hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Park. I am a 3L at Columbia Law. Um, I'm so excited that Albany as well as Columbia was able to work together to create a spring break pro bono caravan. The dates are set for March 1st through 5th of this year. And just a brief summary, students and attorneys will basically be able to work together on pro bono related matters through Albany's remote clinic. And to give uh, anybody who is basically wondering what a caravan is a brief background, spring break pro bono caravans are typically offered at really all law schools. And basically students can spend their spring break week, week working at legal services and public interest organizations across the US and sometimes abroad. Of course, because of COVID and our remote environment, all of the clinics this year are going to be remote. Um, basically students work intensively with one another, new colleagues and new communities to provide legal assistance. The benefit of these caravans are that 2Ls and 3Ls are able to complete their Columbia mandatory pro bono graduation requirement, which is 40 hours, and 1Ls, 2Ls, and 3Ls are able to count these hours towards their New York State pro bono requirement, which as May mentioned beforehand, is 50 hours. The goals that we want to achieve out of this caravan are to allow students to shadow volunteer attorneys in the remote clinic calls, and also allow students to help volunteer attorneys to potentially research on these legal matters and possible legal referrals. Additionally, after this caravan is over, and as May mentioned, it is basically a test process. We're going to see how successfully it runs. Um, students can continue to participate in the remote clinic after the caravan ends. So it's a really great introduction into how students can continue to be involved in pro bono matters, as well as continue to contribute to Albany and its remote clinic. Additionally, we want students to research and update the COVID-19 research page for the pro bono committee. Um, as you all put, basically know uh, everything, all the regulations, all the laws, all the policies changes, and we have to adapt our information to that. So it's a really great way for students to be at the forefront of everything that's going on um, in terms of COVID and to assist users who are reading this information. And finally, we want students to join the monthly meeting of the pro bono committee for a, basically a meet and greet. It will allow students to connect with different attorneys um, and basically have a great networking session, basically to see what Albany has to offer them as well. Um, May, I'm going to share my screen right now just to show the tentative schedule. Uh, I do not have that feature, so, it, oh, let me see. Yep, if, if you could make me the co-host again, potentially, then I can, I can share my screen. No problem. 
Perfect, thank you. Okay, so this is just, uh, can everybody see this tentative schedule? Uh, yes. Perfect, okay. So basically students will be working from 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. I will say that we do have some international applicants and of course 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. East Coast time may not be reasonable for them. So we can definitely work with you if you are international. Um, Monday will definitely be more of a training session. Um, we will be setting expectations and seeing what students want from the caravan as well as what we expect from the students. Um, we will have an introduction by Albany attorneys basically talking about what to expect out of this caravan. Um, students will also be able to re-watch this recording, um, this presentation session, um, and we will send them the link as well. And we'll also have a training session about the remote clinic and the calls, how to interact with clients, how to behave professionally, um, things like that. Additionally, the assignments that we are going to be giving to each student will be provided. Um, and I will go into more detail about that at the end of uh, after the scheduling process. Tuesday, we will continue working on these assignments. The research projects should really take up the brunt of Monday as well as Tuesday. Um, on Wednesday, we really want to have a briefing just to basically recap everything that has occurred on Monday and Tuesday. As I mentioned beforehand, a week is really not a lot to get <laughs> everything done. And um, since Wednesday is basically the halfway point, we want to make sure that students are also getting as much out of the caravan as they can, as well as what they are contributing. So that will be a great way to talk to them and see uh, basically where they are at. We also have a 5 p.m. deadline of submitting the research as well as the updates to May, who of course is a remote clinic coordinator and has done so much in terms of organizing this, uh, uh, helping to organize this caravan. On Thursday, we're planning for the research assignments to be completed, but aside from the pro bono activities that these students will be working on, we also want them to have professional development opportunities as well. It basically gives them an insight into what Albany can offer students um, and also allows them to connect to different attorneys as well. So one way that we can do this is creating personal statements that are about two to three pages that Albany attorneys will look into, um, potentially May, potentially others, um, and students can work with them to uh, revise a personal statements and basically have a polished finished product at the end of this caravan session. As well on Friday, we're also going to have the uh, PBCS leadership team monthly meeting at 1 p.m. Um, and again, this is a great way for students to meet Albany attorneys. At the end of all of this, the entire week, um, we'll have a closing debriefing session as well as further questions and answers. I will say that at this point, if students do wanna keep volunteering for the remote clinic, it's a great opportunity at this point to basically reiterate their interest and we can work with them to see how they can continue to volunteer as well. So this week long caravan will be a great introduction session into what the remote clinic has to offer and potentially what it could become <laughs> as uh, students become more involved in the future as well. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I will move on to talk more about the assignment structure. So we basically talked about different ways the students could be involved. The first is creating, uh, basically working with students and attorneys to have remote clinic calls and work um, where students will listen in on the clinic calls and um, also as, a, as well as the consultations. And afterwards, students can also draft memos or have further research relating to the legal issue at hand and work with the attorney to make sure that the call or whatever is going on is resolved. The second assignment that we are considering are the research assignments. So students will check for updates of Supreme, Civil, Housing, and Family Courts. And students will be assigned these uh, issues based on the boroughs of New York City. So <laughs> students can actually look at nycourts.gov to figure out what uh, more about these subheadings and also learn more about these different issues as well. They can also research and update on these assigned topics under federal, state, and local laws. We split these uh, topics up into five topics. So that's consumer debt and foreclosure law, immigration, housing, employment, and family law. But of course, if students are interested in other topics, they should feel free to reach out to us and talk to us because we want to make sure they're getting the most out of this caravan as well. Um, in addition to these research, in, in a, as an aside, of course, we're also going to have them research and update Albany's COVID-19 resource page. Um, and students who are also multilingual can exist, assist in translating the updates for the research page because it's not just English speakers that are in need of COVID resources. Of course, um, the people that are accessing this website 
um, would benefit from different languages as well, which would be uh, amazing for Albany, I believe. And then finally, in the event that students complete all of their assignments, which is unlikely because there's so much research to be done and so much to be updated, um, we are working to implement a monthly podcast for Albany in order to provide more legal resources and knowledge to the community. Um, and students can actually assist with that and make sure that the infrastructure is there, the planning and scheduling is there, um, and, and we can work to plan towards that. Additionally, since it is a remote environment, people can't meet with each other in person. It becomes difficult for uh, a remote clinic compared to an in-person clinic, but we want to make it as connected as possible. So we'll also have a group me or a Slack or some sort of messaging device where students can get to know each other alongside anyone else or the attorneys that are working as well. So uh, if students have any other questions or if you want to know more about this caravan, feel free to contact me or May. I'm so excited that this is you know, this is up and running. Um, and I look forward to working with you all in March. Thank you so much, Jenny. I just want to add a little point that uh, William Lee, who is the vice president of the student committee, will also be co-supervising along with me. Um, I hope that the students who join this caravan will um, get to build a, a, a strong relationship with one another only because when you are in law school and during this period of time, not a lot of people are attending classes, um, meeting other law students. And what I find is that you, you, when you start graduating, you start working, knowing those who graduated with you is extremely important. It builds networking skills. Um, and I'm hoping that you, both, you all will be able to achieve that. And now like um, to our last presentation, Judy, would you like to introduce our housing expert, um, Jonathan Hernandez, and I'm going to make him uh, one of our co-hosts. Okay. Um there was a quick question in the chat about the caravan, uh, about uh, NYU law students no longer have a spring break. Will they be able to participate in the caravan? Uh, I, I can answer this, May, if that's all right with you. Sure. Um, so this caravan, uh, in terms of Columbia specifically, of course, we have a spring break, and so it will, it will be a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. session, but I do believe NYU law students or students who are interested are still able to participate in the remote clinic um, through, through other opportunities besides the caravan. Um, I'm not sure. It, it's surprising to me at first that <laughs> NYU doesn't have a spring break, but um, if the 9 to 5 p.m. session doesn't work, obviously we can work with you specifically or others who are interested to find a schedule that works, that works best for you. Any more questions? I'm just trying to take a look at this. Uh, I think that was it. Um, Jonathan, do you uh, want me to share screen or are you able to? Sure. Um, if you could share screen, um, that'd be great. It's um, hard for me to toggle between Zoom and um, okay. this, right. um, PDF, but if we could start with uh, non-payment training materials. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so yeah, just by way of background, my name is Jonathan Hernandez. I'm a staff attorney with the um, Bronx Neighborhood Office of the Legal Aid Society. Um, I joke around that now it's the virtual neighborhood office because um, of the pandemic. So it's um, I, I, I'm serving clients virtually at, at the moment. Um, and I think to fully understand um, New York City Housing Court, um, we have to kind of know how um, the proceedings in the housing court work. Uh, right now, um, or housing court cases are summary proceedings. So everything moves fast in, in housing court. Um, I think litigants expect the housing court case life to be around one or two appearances and um, the case is done. Um, usually in a non-payment case, there's a first appearance and then um, at the courthouse, the uh, tenant or landlord agree on a stipulation. And then if um, everything works out, the tenant pays back all the money, case is closed. But uh, we won't, <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't have a job if it was just that simple, right? Um, so um, in between, um, uh, um, before filing the petition, the landlord um, is supposed to serve a rent demand, which um, I, uh, which is on the screen here. Um, it's many pathways of a non-payment case. Um, not every case goes this, um, this way. Um, and 
the clients that you see at the pro bono clinic may come uh, in different stages of the proceeding. Um, they may come to you um, at the second to last stage where they're served with a notice of eviction and ask you, what should I do next? Um, they may come to you if, when they get the, the written rent demand. Um, and so it, it could be many different scenarios where um, um, you might get these uh, uh, questions from the pro bono um, client. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And I just wanted to start off too that um, this is how it usually works um, pre-pandemic. Right now, it's still kind of um, in this weird in-between phase where court conferences are being held virtually. Um, and then, but the, the courthouses are open, but for emergency cases, um, usually emergency cases are uh, non uh for, I'm sorry, um, illegal lockout cases um, where a tenant is, um, has the locks changed on them and they need to regain possession of the apartment or um, HP cases, which are housing part cases. Those are basically cases that tenants can bring um, to sue their landlord for repairs. Um, such we're in it's like 22 degrees out. Um, if a tenant doesn't have any heat in the apartment, um, they could sue their landlord for, for no heat. And, um, and nuisance cases currently, um, um, and I'll get to that later, um, but right in front of you is what we have is a rent demand. Um, before even filing the case in housing court, a landlord's supposed to serve a 14 day notice um, that um, claims the, the, the rent amount owed and it has to be a good faith uh, approximation of the, the rent that's owed um, and needs to be signed and dated by the landlord or a landlord agent, uh, someone with personal knowledge of the, um, the rent that's owed. Um, I just wanted to show you um, what this might look like because you might have a tenant coming into the pro bono clinic and um, freaking out that they got a rent demand, but um, until the landlord files the housing case, the non-payment case, it doesn't have um, much legal effect. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Um, this is what a petition looks like. And I changed some of the, the party names so it's just, it just doesn't give any identifying um, information. Um, but if a tenant brings to you um, this piece of paper, they are soon to be in court or they're already in court. Um, when they're served with a petition, they are, uh, tenants are supposed to go to, in, in normal times, they're supposed to go to the housing court and file what's called an answer um, to respond to the alleged claims of these petitions. And, um, and then they'll be uh, given a court date to return. Um, but if you get a tenant that comes with this petition, they have a, a lawsuit, um, they're being sued by the landlord basically. And there are a common things you wanna just um, look for because um, in the setting of a pro bono clinic, you're just kind of looking for advice and then maybe refer them to um, legal services attorneys that could, um, if they qualify, be represented in their housing court case. Um, but I, the print may be too small, but what you wanna look for is um, Paragraph two, uh, the tenant name. It's uh, important to know that your tenant, uh, the client that walks in the door is actually the one being sued. Um, and is not the, uh, it, you're, and figure out if they're uh, liable for the rent. Um, it's possible that you're uh, the person that comes into, or you talk to at the pro bono clinic, maybe a friend of the tenant or um, a roommate of the tenant and maybe under John or uh, pseudonym of John or Dave, Jane Doe. So you just kind of want to clarify if, um, first if that's the tenant, that, uh, the person you're speaking with is the tenant uh, um, of record in the apartment. Uh, secondly, um, you want to look at uh, in paragraph two, um, the rent amount that's allegedly owed. The um, for this instance, um, the rent is that is allegedly owed per month is uh, $1,550. Um, you want to double check with the tenant that that's the correct amount that's, um, that, they are, that they understand the rent to be. Um, they may 
have a housing subsidy that pays for a portion of the rent. So they may not be um, liable for the full amount that's alleged on the, in the petition. And the, or maybe the landlord is um, charging the, the, the wrong rent. Um, they, they um, been just out of uh, habit, just raising the rent without uh, realizing a renewal lease wasn't signed that year or um, they're charging a higher rent, even though they agreed to what's called a preferential rent, which is a lower rent, um, anything um, that's below what the legal rent is in a um, in the lease. Um, and yeah, you just want to make sure that that's um, the correct amount. Um, you also want to watch out for legal fees and late fees because those, um, can't be or not rent in the purposes of um, housing court. Um, those could be sought outside of housing court. So a tenant can't be evicted if they don't pay uh, those legal fees. But sometimes um, some litigants want to um, include legal fees in what's owed. But uh, that's uh, that's why lawyer like the right to counsel. Um, movement exists in New York City, where if a tenant is within a certain, certain income and part uh, and has um, certain household de demographics that they may qualify for a free lawyer. So those are things that um, you might, uh, they might spot. Um, another important note in a, um, to, note, to note in the petition is paragraph seven to see if their rent stabilized. Um, I, could, I could have spent the whole 15, 30 minutes on rent stabilization alone. Um, so when a tenant comes in, you might want to ask if their rent apartment's rent regulated. If they don't know what rent regulated is, you might want to ask them it, what their um, what does their lease look like? Um, does it have uh, rent stabilization on it? Does it um, does your landlord offer a one or two year um, renewal lease? Um, without seeing the document in front of you, um, it will be hard to really determine that. But um, at least you could kind of get a hint of what um, your tailor your, your advice might be for um, for that tenant, but um, yeah, so, um, rent stabilized tenants have um, stronger rights than those who are in market rate or um, non regulated apartments. So that's something to look out for. Um, but that's when we're in normal times. Uh, we are not for um, the past few months. So. Um, the way that housing court is working right now, um, we are in um, All right, I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, so we are in the middle of a 60 day stay um, per a um, executive order from um, Governor Cuomo that has um, made cases like this for non-payment for to give tenants ability to fill out a um, COVID hardship um, declaration. So we could share that next. So this is um, what if a, a tenant has a current case in housing court right now, they should, um, the court should be mailing the, this notice to the tenant and what this notice basically um, does is give the court notice that they fall under um, one of one or both categories of um, protections under the new law where they can't have their case heard until after May 1st. Um, if we go down to the second page, we could take a look at um, the certain options. So, um, this is very, uh, I would like to say that this document's very liberal um, in interpretation in terms of tenant protection. Um, if you start in the beginning, of the, um, it has any tenant or lawful occupant or other person responsible for paying rent or use of occupancy can fill out this declaration. Um, so they don't have to be uh, on the lease, but they could be somehow connected to the apartment and fill this out. And if they fall under the um, one or two categories, they could send it to the court and have their case postponed until after May. Um, this 
Uh, first category is financial hardship. Um, I think it would be, um, I would bore you if I read every single um, paragraph of what's covered, but basically if your income has somewhat changed during the pandemic, if that you spent um, more of your um, income on expenses, that you paid, you paid more for food, um, if you um, lost hours at a job, I would argue that that would um, that you would be covered under paragraph um, select, uh, category A of financial hardship. Um, the next category is B. Um, it's if you have a certain health um, underlying condition that may prevent you from coming to court, or um, somebody in your household that may have an increased risk of severe illness or exposure to COVID-19, um, you would select that. Um, that category. Um, you're not prevented from choosing one or the other. You could select both um, and you could send, sign and date it and send it to the court um, by mail. Or uh, I think they have, um, in the beginning, they should explain where you should send it. But um, yeah, so, um, and you could also call um, to, to, send, um, to send that. Uh, this document. And if right now, to my understanding, these declarations are not being challenged um, before these cases are calendared after May. So if your the, your tenant comes to you and has questions about this declaration, I would ask them to, to fill uh, have them fill it out um, if they want their case postponed to after May. And if they fall on those categories, under one of those categories. And um, it's currently unclear when the due date is for this COVID hardship declaration. So if they, ha if your client has an active case in housing court, um, the case may just be postponed till um, in, to March um, when the 60 day stay uh, is con concludes in the end of uh, February. But, um, for the purposes of advising the tenant if they have the right of, um, or if they're covered under the hardship declaration, I would have them try to send it in, but the sooner the better. Um, the next topic I wanna to talk about is answering the petition um, because we are in a virtual world. Um, right now in um, housing court, there are three ways where you could answer the petition if the tenant has received it. Uh, first is by phone. Um, and these are the phone numbers that each borough has set up for um, usually um, a tenant would call this number and a clerk would answer and they would ask them if um, they would like to file the answer to the phone and um, if they received um, they could answer some questions and then have their answer deemed filed. Um, the second way of answering a petition right now um, with housing court catching up to other courts, New York system courts, and um, they now have e-filing. Um, this wasn't true a year ago. Everything was um, paper-based. Um, so if your tenant that comes to um, the pro bono clinic is tech savvy enough, they may want to file their answer through NYSEF. Um, and um, maybe, I don't know if um, they have the answer in front of you. I don't know if um, we have that. Um, this is going to be uh, the sample uh, non-payment answer. Um, I'm gonna try and find it from oh. my files. For example, one moment. But Jonathan, with like um, the help center, how often do you think like someone will have uh, an interpreter to help someone who may not uh, speak English to help them answer or to file like an answer by, by the phone call? Like, have you had any experience in which 
um, someone would contact the help center and not being able to, I mean, would it be better to have someone who speaks um, English when they call together or, or should they trust in the court system to provide them with um, an interpreter? Um, that's a good question. Um, I believe the numbers that are here um, listed are English, but when they call, um, when they send a call, I think they could request a um, interpreter. I don't, I'm not 100% sure how interpreter um, services are um, are being conducted right now. So uh, it doesn't hurt to, to ask, but if, if possible, I think if they have uh, an English family member or friend that could help um, answer on over the phone, I think that would be preferable than, um, and then uh, the third option, which is going to be going in person, um, which the courts are open and if um, a tenant is adamant, can go to um, the courthouse to, to answer, but um, they would have to test um, uh, they would have to test the health and safety um, requirements to enter the courthouse. But it's also possible the court might turn them away and tell them to call um, the, uh, the health center because depending on staffing, they might not have somebody to, to, have, to have the answer. Mm. Um, so thank you for pulling this up. So this is what a answer in housing court looks like. Um, a pro se answer, um, a tenant that's not represented. And I would, I mean, tenant can um, check off whatever they um, believe the, uh, the situation might be. Um, they didn't receive notice of petition and petition. So that goes against the, the service of process, which in housing court could be three ways. Um, service can be um, initiated by personal service, um, I'm sure conspicuous service and um, which is our substitute service. Um, going back to civil procedure, personal service is personally giving the, um, uh, the petition and uh, the predicate notices to tenant, substitute service, um, process service, find somebody that's of suitable age, 18 and above, that's um, living in the apartment. And third option is conspicuous service, which is a uh, process server attempts to serve the court papers. But after um, two tries, um, once in the morning, once in the evening, then um, they could leave the court paper there as a nail in mail, and then also mail the, the court um, papers by um, by first class mailing to the tenant. So they could be um, made aware of the, the lawsuit that's against, um, against them. Um, but I won't go into further detail about um, the other categories, but these are like the options that tenant could select if um, it fits their situation. If, um, and that will start, that we, they would get a court date after filing this answer, but Practically speaking, they wouldn't get a court date until after um, after February um, at the earliest. And I would strongly suggest if you have a tenant and they're at the um, answer stage or or any stage of housing court to refer um, to refer their case to a free legal services attorney. Um, usually they um, could call a, f a phone number um, for their housing court and then ask for a free legal uh, representative and represent ask for free legal representation. And usually that there's a, a legal service provider that's um, staffing the day and they could be connected to that legal service provider. Um, so I would strongly suggest that. And as a last note, before I take any questions, um, we will be as a joint effort with the pro bono committee and the government service public interest committee. Um, we're gonna have a housing know your rights webinar on February 10th from six to seven. If you wanna learn more about this topic and also the current climate of housing court, 
I would strongly suggest you register. Um, we're going to also have um, the um, the event inter uh, simultaneously interpreted. Um, we discovered this uh, Zoom feature um, recently, and we're going to have the um, hopefully have the event uh, interpreted in Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, and Nepal and uh, Nepali. Um, and hopefully more languages. So that's pretty exciting. And um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. I have tried my best to condense a, what could be a three hour training and many hours of um, on hand training into 30 minutes, but I'm sure there's a lot of questions or maybe some questions. And that's the, the flyer. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I believe that um, with our remote clinic moving forward, um, it's not that we, we're, we're trying to help people fill out the paperwork, the answer form, but what we can do is, like I asked before, if the court cannot provide an interpreter, what we may be able to help with is have our volunteers contact the court along with the uh, respondent to file the answer with the court representative. And then this way they can at least log in the answer. How important is it to actually log in an answer, Jonathan? I would say, I mean, the lawyer me says, I mean, absolutely right now, if you have the ability to file an answer, I'd, I'd file it. Um, practically speaking, um, since we are still in the pandemic and some of this information still being like, translated and or being rolled out. Um, right now, the courts aren't taking any, aren't taking any defaults. Um, so until, I don't know, it's hard to say. I would, until end of February, I would, if the tenant hasn't had uh, the ability to file an answer, um, start doing that. I, I would start doing that now, um, but we, we, I don't. I'm not, I'm not sure how things will will um, play out after um, February, but I think they would start calendaring cases. Um, the court would start calendaring cases after um, in March if they're, they they haven't um, if the tenant hasn't answered or respondent hasn't answered the petition. Thanks. Um, I just want to double check the chat room um, to see if anyone has questions. Um, and now I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Karen Yao. She is one of our co-chairs for our pro bono committee services. Um, hi, Karen. Um, thank you for helping us uh, speak and to end this program. You will be our last presenter. Thank you. Well, First of all, I wanted to thank May, Judy, Kwok, Jesse, and Jonathan for doing such a great job tonight. Um, and Jenny. Really, and thank you, uh, and Jenny. Um, it really was great to hear from all of you. And it is so wonderful to see all of you who are on, online right now uh, and participating in this training. Now, I would be remiss if I don't introduce um, one of the other co-chair besides Judy, who's also on the call, and that's Karen Lin. Karen, would you like to say hi? <laughs> All right, so Karen Lin said hi. Um, I just want to add a couple of things. One is that um, Jonathan Hernandez is a new dad. The fact that Jonathan is giving a training at 5 p.m. and did such a thorough job is really a testament to his dedication. The second thing is, um, like Kwok and, Je um, and Jesse, I've always been fascinated with um, interpretation and how you can be such a facilitator and such a barrier to people getting help. Um, for me, an interpreter, is a superhero. You know how Superman, you know, bullets get, you know, hits him and then the bullets bounce back. The way I think about a, a wonderful interpreter is that say English, 
you know, goes through that superhero interpreter and whatever target language then comes right out exactly the same. Um, and I know that all of you will strive for that level of um, uh, proficiency when you interpret. And for our attorney um, volunteers, your assistance will no doubt help literally hundreds of people. So again, thank you. Now, May has already introduced Will Lee. I don't know if Will is on, still on the Zoom call, but if he is, I don't know if he wants to actually just say hi to everyone. Will? Will is someone who you probably know already, and if you don't, you should, because he will be the co-supervisor of this project with May. With that, i like to end and just, again, thank all of you for your participation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you guys have, uh, understand more about what the remote clinic and the caravan will be doing. Um, if we have no more questions, um, have a great night. Take care folks. <laughs>